So, Shabbat Shalom. Um, Judaism is married to the story of creation. And by that, I, I mean that we are in the world, and we are of the world, and we're not of another. We are truly rooted in the reality of the created world. Judaism promises no escape from the world, no escape from the pressures and the pain of reality. If you believe, it doesn't mean you're going to be granted extra life, not by any means. And even its, its idea of salvation doesn't bring us away from the world and its realities. It forces us to work for a better world. The very first line in the Torah speaks of creation. In the beginning, God created. We begin with the creation of the world. We're to be concerned with this world, the creatures of the world, the creatures of the sea, the fall of the air, the beasts and the cattle, everything that creeps upon the ground. And we are to be concerned with human beings. The Bible focuses attention on the promises and failures, the sins and lusts, the dreams and desires of our forefathers, our ancestors. It doesn't hide any of their problems. The Bible focuses attention on the human being and believes that the human being is endowed with the image of God. So Judaism is married to this reality and our tradition doesn't flinch from an encounter with problems and trouble. It doesn't flinch from the encounter with sickness or death. It doesn't pretend they don't exist, but rather it understands they are part of the human condition. No, we don't turn away from any real life challenge. So Judaism is a way of life that responds to reality. It's not just something that exists in texts and law. Judaism is breathed in our everyday reality and the realities of your life and my life. So Jewish life is not simply defined, however, by the text, it's not defined by the scholars, it's not defined by the rabbis. The truth is that what is Jewish is defined by you and me. It's the way we as Jews live our lives. Over the years, as people have become more informed by the truths of life, from living life, from experience, I have come to believe that there really is a growing need for us to understand that part of the decision-making that we make as Jews is autonomous, that we are informed by a lot of different factors in our lives. We're informed by our experience, our capacity to gain knowledge and to discern that knowledge. You, we, we don't always depend on someone else's authority to decide. This attitude is something that began to emerge in my life as a rabbi in a very real way, a very significant way. It shook me, actually, in a piece that was written by Rabbi Harold Showweis, the Hronoli Vracha of Los Angeles. And I read it for the first time in 1992. It was during the debate that was beginning and then starting to rage in Jewish circles amongst rabbis and congregants about homosexuality and Judaism, homosexuality and marriage, homosexuality and participation. A woman who was a regular at his synagogue came one night to speak to him privately. And Scholweis wrote the following. This woman sat across from me at my desk and she said, you may remember that my son who attended Hebrew High School, my son who was a student at UCLA and the University of Judaism, he kept the secret of his orientation to himself. And whenever the issues of gays and lesbians came up, he felt threatened, he was ridiculed, he was humiliated, he was hurt. And then one day he announced that he was going to San Francisco because he learned about a cure. A friend had suggested the right therapist who would change him, would teach him to be straight and normal. 
I kept receiving a number of letters from him. He seemed to be ebullient. Things were fine, it seemed. He had changed, he said. He was a new man. And then I discovered much too late that he was lying. He was lying to me and to himself. And then after a lengthy description, she ends, Rabbi, my son took his life. She stopped speaking and then she looked at me. She said, I'm here to ask you, Rabbi, was my son an abomination? Was he punished? Is that why he died? And she was visibly shaken. Her eyes were full of tears and pain, despair and anger. I want to know, she continued, what does Judaism say about my son? Was he guilty or was I? Was I too strong? Was this my fault? Did I dom dominate too much as a mother or was my husband too weak? She had come to me looking for a posthumous eulogy. Her question never left me. It's one thing to read a scientific paper. It's one thing to read the Torah. It's one thing to examine a rabbinic text. And it's another thing when you look in the pained eyes of another human being. Rabbi Shulweis, who is honored and revered, became an outspoken spoken advocate for gay rights in Judaism. In the beginning, certainly, he was swimming against the stream. But ultimately, he had a very powerful voice and made a difference. And our people and our communities, they changed. So I raise this not because I want to speak about these issues of gender and sexual orientation. It's really because of another issue. And it's an issue that I believe needs our consideration and perhaps even our involvement in a productive way. It's an issue that requires of us something that Schulweis did and that we all need to do. And that is to be able to listen to people, to be able to look into people's eyes, to be able to feel their pain, to understand their situation, and to respond to them as human beings, human beings who are created in the image of God. The issue that I'm connecting it to right now is the issue of abortion. It's become a very big issue once again in the United States. It's a hot political issue. And it's being determined not just by the politics, but by the courts. And I began to think that just maybe these are the wrong places for the discussions to be happening. Not the place for decision making about an issue that is so deeply, deeply personal. If it's based on religious ideation, religious values, religious law as to when human life begins, then we understand there's great diversity in the response to that in our nation, which is pluralistic and diverse, should not be doing this because of a particular religious notion of life. It is knowing real human beings. It is looking into the eyes of a young daughter or your granddaughter or even a stranger. It's hearing from them, sitting face to face with them that can help us develop attitudes and opinions that may be the most significant. And that could lead to a certain transformation and perhaps there will emerge a sense that maybe there are people who hold different opinions and we have to respect people for their opinions, a realization that there are different religious traditions that view this differently, that you and I can respond differently to this question and we should all be protected by law. Every human being has a story. And we'd all be better off listening to the stories and to those who are engaged in this often torturous decision. Let me share one voice. It's a voice that I heard this past week on National Public Radio. And it's not about a rape victim. 
It's not about a pregnancy that took place after an incestuous relationship, but it's all about a woman's right to choose. Katja Riddle of NPR, she interviewed Mercy Ventura Gonzalez the night before her abortion. Gonzalez said in the interview, I am absolutely terrified. I am so scared. And Riddle commented, there's guilt, grief, anger, anger with herself. But one thing this 23-year-old woman, Mercy Ventura Gonzalez, is not feeling is doubt. This is the right choice, Gonzalez said. I'm so stressed out. I am so stretched thin. She was there with her son, Axel, who's two years old, and her husband of five years. Ventura Gonzalez said, I don't think I can give love to another baby right now. The baby was babbling in the background, and then she said, the family traveled two hours for the abortion in this suburb of Boise called Meridian. It was the closest available appointment to their home in Twin Falls, Idaho. Cody Sims, the father, is 27 years old. He said, I would like to be a dad again, but this isn't the right time, and you'll hear why. Maybe down the road we will raise a second child, but right now it's taking us every bit of energy. We're barely treading water in this life. We've been together since we met in a homeless shelter in Washington four years ago. We've spent so many nights sleeping in the streets. Gonzalez said, we would set up camp in the woods. We would set up camp in the alcoves of local business just to find a warm place for ourselves and our son. And then the two of them got jobs washing pots and dishes in a restaurant, and she got pregnant for the first time. They made a plan, they moved to Idaho. It was a turning point, and they were feeling pretty strong, barely making it. And we know they came from a very, very depressed, economically depressed environment and family. They didn't have any of the advantages that our children have. She said, I knew that I could do it. I knew that I could be there for my son, no matter what happened. And so they're working at restaurant jobs now, living week to week, spending nights outdoors, spending nights in motels. Another child would tip their balance. Gonzalez said the pregnancy feels so different than her first because she said this one would destroy my family. It would destroy my capacity to work as an appropriate mother for Axel. It would destroy my ability to care for my family and to live and to eat. So I am not attached to what's in my womb. Is it crazy to feel like that? I know there's a spirit there that will come back into someone else who will handle the baby, but it's not me. It's not me, it would destroy me. And I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry my body is carrying this this is the worst decision I've had to make. So the reporter from NPR said, Idaho is one of about two dozen states poised to ban abortions if Roe fails. In that scenario, Gonzalez would likely have to travel then to Oregon for the procedure. It's an additional five hours of driving. Gonzalez predicts the consequences would be dire for women like herself. She says abortions are not gonna stop. We know that from history, we know that from our world, they're not gonna stop. People are going to do them illegally and in more dangerous ways. And through this all, the dad is caring for the two-year-old. In the morning, it was 29 degrees out, still dark. They arrived at the clinic. A man across the street was holding a sign, abortion is murder, it read. And the man yelled at her when she stepped out of her car. Change your mind, change your mind, he shouted. A very difficult decision had already been made. Gonzalez said, part of me wants to go yell back, but I have to be an adult about this. So instead, she hugged her son in the car seat. She kissed him. She told him how much she loves him. But she had to be separated from him while she went into the clinic. I miss you and I love you, she said to her husband and her son. 
The husband indicated they had no money, and the whole trip, the car, the hotel, the gas, the abortion would cost more than $1,200. It's far too much for the couple, but they did receive financial assistance from a nonprofit called the Northwest Abortion Access Fund. After hours in the waiting room and two hours for the procedure, Ventura Gon Gonzalez was ready to go home. She said the following, it feels good, I feel relieved, it wasn't right. I would not have survived. We would not have survived as a couple and as a family. I want to be a great son for my, a great mom for my son, and he needs me. She was shaking from the adrenaline and the fatigue of the long day. I can take care of my son now, she said. I will go back to work, and I can, and I won't have to worry now. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay, she repeated. After a short rest, Gonzalez walked outside where her son and partner were waiting in the rental car. A long drive home was ahead of them. She climbed into the passenger seat. She held a warm compress over her abdomen. She wore a t-shirt she recently salvaged from a box of free clothes on a sidewalk on the front with the words, I am strong and I am beautiful. She's a good woman. She was born into poverty she struggled her entire life. She was now, in a very ironic way, giving herself a new chance. I wasn't inspired to bring this today because of the larger publication, public conversation around us, but as I read the beginning of Parshat Mishpatim, I realized there is the text that we form our opinions based on. It's just the first text. In Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 24, we find the core text that allows, a Jewish, a Jew, for allow, allows for a Jewish position that permits abortion. Without going into the legalisms that evolved and the development of Jewish attitudes, we find that the loss of a fetus is not dealt with the courts in the same way as the murder of a mother. And as the law evolved through the generations, we learned different things. We learned that the fetus is considered to be a part of the mother's body, not a separate entity in the beginning. We learned that her life takes precedence. And that means, according to the famous teshuva done by Rabbi Isaac Klein of our own movement, this has to do with the mother's physical and mental well-being. And all of us understand there's a very private dimension to all of this. A woman has a right to make decisions for her own body. And in our tradition, we see that her rights supersede that of an unborn fetus, even until birth. There's so much nuance and challenge in this. There are gray areas. We understand this whole notion of viability, and viability has certainly changed over time as we learn more and have a better capability to deal with neonates as our technology has developed, as medicine has developed, and we're very well aware of that. We know this is very deeply connected to poverty and to sexual mores and to education. We need, as always, however, to hear each other's voices, the voices of those who struggle the voices of, of the desire for an abortion that brings its own unique set of circumstances in every case. In this conversation, I rarely hear spoken about in public. In this conversation, I rarely hear spoken about in public anything about the moral and financial obligations of the man who impregnates a woman. You don't hear any conversation about the responsibility of a man in this. The man can walk away and never turn back to his partner or the baby or his obligations. I also want to share with you, I've been a rabbi for 40 years, and I have never once, never, I'm sorry, once in 40 years has someone come to me asking what the position would be from our tradition have an abortion. And what that makes me think, and I do a lot of counseling, what that makes me think is that women realize 
It's a decision they have to make for themselves. They make it with their doctors. They make it with their families. Those who are opposed to abortion really should take responsibility as men and fathers and a society needs to take responsibility for those without. And we don't do that in our culture and we should do it better. And those who cry that abortion is murder should look seriously at their positions on guns and violence and viruses in our society. It's so hard to accept the hypocrisy when we're speaking about life. Recently, I spoke to a man who told me that, a Jewish man, that he's, he believes abortion is murder. And I said, that's not what the Jewish tradition says. He said, no, I believe it. And I said, you can believe that. Did you ever speak to your daughter? And I know he has daughters. Have you ever spoken to your daughters about this? And he said, no. Our democracy can disintegrate if we turn our government into a heavy-handed agent for morality. Government must protect the greater good, but not impose the will of some over others. We have diverse religious traditions, and there are many people without a religious tradition. And all of the, those values come into people's lives at the most important moments. My teacher, former chancellor of JTS, Ismar Shorsh, quoted Oliver Wendell Holmes' observation that a page of history is worth a volume of logic. Surely that page would show that morality works best when we listen to the people who are trying to preserve their lives and the lives of others. There are moments when we allow for autonomous decision making it has to be that way if we respect the dignity of the individual and the human being. Perhaps in the realm of a woman's right to choose her own destiny, the moment is really now. It's one of the most difficult issues that our country is facing, and it goes way beyond the issue of abortion. It has to do with who determines your values. For our sake here, I suggest that we continue to learn more from the texts in our tradition that teach us about this difficult decision. One of the beauties of our tradition is it doesn't take it as being a simple matter at all. It realizes the complexity, it realizes the complexity in this issue as much as it realizes the complexity of life itself. But we find incredible wisdom in our ancient yet continually evolving tradition. And that is where we find our values. Shabbat Shalom.